grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So uh, this story from Matthew is one of the more kind of famous stories that we know about uh, in the scriptures, one that, that's like uh, attested to and well known and that you can kind of talk about and kids, even after just hearing a few, uh, a few times about it, can tell you the story and kind of walk you through the basics of the narrative. But I'm always struck in this passage of scripture by how many details we fill in without actually uh, knowing about it for sure without scripture actually telling us. We had this telling reminder of this at our New Year's Eve party where Georgia quizzed us on all of the um, kind of Christmas story Bible facts and we had this true and false uh, um, test or quiz that she gave us about all these Bible facts and it was amazing how many people got them wrong uh, because of the mix of kind of legend and scripture that are sort of mixed together oftentimes. Um, so it's interesting, just some kind of like facts about the uh, about this story of the wise men seeking Jesus. One is that nobody ever called them wise in the scripture, actually. You know, like they were never called wise uh, or uh, they were never called kings. Nobody ever, nobody ever said that in the scriptures. I don't know if you noticed it. They just called them magi or kind of like magicians and astrologers. When I was a kid, I always just envisioned them walking through the desert singing, We three kings of Orient are. That was like my vision of, of, uh, of the narrative of Matthew 2. But it's not particularly scriptural. So we don't know if they were wise or foolish. They did some wise things. Uh, but they were magi. Strikingly, we actually don't know where they're from either. Some people think they were from Persia. Some th people think they were from the Orient. Some people think they were from Babylon. All we really know, the only direction that it gives us is that they were from the East. Do you know that we don't even know actually how many there were? It just says magi. No nowhere in the scripture Bible verses does it even say that there were three of them. We just know that there were plural magi. Could be you know, 10, could be 50. I always like this, uh, this, this picture by Tissot, who uh, envisioned the Magi. You have three people in front, but you have this whole caravan of individuals following behind, uh, coming to worship the, uh, the, the newborn king of the Jews. Kind of fascinating how much we kind of fill in the gaps like that. We don't know uh, the star for example. We don't know if it was a naturally occurring star that traveled throughout the year round, and the, the, whether it was a planet or a star or what, and the Magi followed that, or whether it was like a miraculous phenomenon that God put in the sky uh, that they followed. We don't know. It's just, it's just not, not certain. But we all have these kind of visions in our minds about this story. And we fill in the gaps with all sorts of other things. So um, the first lesson, I think, that, because this, this, uh, this story has a lot to tell us, but the first lesson I think that it really has to tell us is to just pay attention to the scriptures and to know, uh, know the difference between fiction and fact in the Bible. Uh, this is like, a, I, I, I use this sort of example and I give this sort of point periodically throughout the year because we do it with all sorts of uh, stories in the scriptures where we kind of don't really separate what we're filling in the gaps with and what is actually there. And this Christmas season is when I usually bring it up because it's so typical. Um, you know, like we sing songs like Away in a Manger, which is a great song during Christmas, but it fills in uh, the idea that, you know, Jesus is in a manger, peacefully not, quiet, uh, not crying at all. It doesn't say that in Scripture anywhere. Right? It's just a gap that we sort of fill in with a narrative, and that's not bad, but you as a Christian and me as a Christian have to be able to kind of separate fiction and fact and know our Scriptures so that we're not being kind of misled by even songs and stories and movies or uh, the History Channel or people's sort of minority reports about how they fill in the gaps for the Scriptures. It's good for us to be able to separate fiction from fact. 
um, in this story and in the scriptures as well and in our minds and the stories that we tell about ourselves. The, um, there's a really great passage of of scripture from Acts chapter 17 verse 11 where the Apostle Paul is traveling through uh, the churches and he's teaching them and he goes to the town of Berea and he's teaching them the scriptures and the entire time that he's teaching it says that the Berean church has out not their Bibles but like the scriptures right the scrolls that were in the synagogues uh, that that Paul was teaching and talking about and they were comparing saying Paul is quoting things he's teaching things he's teaching all this stuff is this what uh, Scripture accounts for? Is this what the Bible says? And they kind of go back and forth, just holding to Scripture, saying, hey, any teacher of the faith, any song that we sing, any movie that we see about the Scriptures, we are going to let this be the kind of final word and guide about what we believe uh, uh, about, about the Scriptures and what we believe about the truth uh, in the revelation of Christ. And that's a good word for us, both in this story and throughout uh, Scripture, to pay attention to what are you filling in and what is the Word of God actually saying to us, okay? This, uh, this narrative is very wonderful, though, in Matthew chapter 2, and I'm always struck by how little it says about the actual guys, where they came from, what they were like, their names, uh, what they did as, as uh, major occupations or things like that. It doesn't fill in a lot of gaps, but it, instead it tells you what they did, Okay? That's what it focuses on, not who they were, but their actions uh, and the things that they did. And I think that's because this story has to teach us some really wonderful and important lessons about our lives as believers, as followers of Jesus. The first one I think is this, okay? That in the scriptures, God is working in places and people that we would not expect. So, whether you were King Herod or Mary and Joseph, I highly doubt that Herod or anybody else, Mary and Joseph, expected that one day ringing their doorbell or knocking on their door would be these magi from the east, from far away, different religion, different place, different rulers, different leaders, different kings, okay? But they have come from far away to come and worship and lay down treasures and give homage to this newborn king. You would not expect that. I'm sure Mary and Joseph were aghast when they opened the door and there stood these Persian or Babylonian or Eastern uh, magicians and astrologers coming to worship him saying, is there the king of the Jews that's been born here today? We've come from afar to see him, right? That would not be expected in the least. And I think it's really true in our lives too. We can have the normal people that we expect to be followers of Jesus. The normal people that would be sensitive to the word of God and might come to church and enjoy church and come to follow him, uh, come to learn about him. There are people that are kind of safe to talk to. We think, hey, I've got a pretty good shot with this guy. I've got a pretty good chance with this fellow. And then we can think others, I'm, I'm concerned, I'm afraid to talk to this person. They're intimidating to me, or they, I, I guarantee they're going to put me up. I, I don't expect this person to be a follower of Jesus. If the scriptures teach us anything, it's that the most unlikely people are often following Jesus, often become his disciples and his followers. So the word of God that creates faith in us is for everybody. And don't put labels on who has the better chance of becoming a Christian. Okay? There are shocking revelations every year of people who oppose Christ, who are the furthest off individuals, who come to know and follow the Lord. And I think our job as Christians is to look at a world that is far from God and say, let's bring the word of God to these people and see what the Lord does. Not making any sort of qualifications or expectations about what's going to happen, but instead to say, we trust in the word of God to change hearts and lives. I'll also say that as you read through uh, this narrative, not only is God working in places and people we would not expect, but people that you would expect to follow him, would expect to trust in him, they don't. Okay? I mean, think about uh, Herod, who was the king of the Jews, a Jew himself, who had been kind of politically co-opted by the Romans at this time. 
Uh, he comes and is told about the king of the Jews, this Messiah, foretold in the scriptures, born to them, which he should rejoice in, in all honesty, should give thanks and praise to God for, but he doesn't. Instead, he makes this kind of conniving plan to screw up God's plan uh, and, uh, and make sure that this coming king never, ever takes the throne, threatening his life and the lives of every other boy, two years old and younger, in all of Jerusalem and all of Bethlehem. Also, his court uh, of, of leaders of the Jews and Pharisees and Sadducees and teachers of the law that he calls to say, hey, where's the king of the Jews going to be born? They tell you right away. Do you notice that? They answer. He says, Where, where's, where's going to be born king of the Jews? And they asked. And, and, they, and, the, uh, and the teachers and chief priests said, in Bethlehem, in Judea. We know the Bible. It's written, but you, O Bethlehem, the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be shepherd of my people Israel. They quote the scriptures right away. It's on the tip of their tongue. And yet, even though they are a short 20 miles from Jerusalem, none of them go. Isn't that fascinating? That none of them. Though they, are, they, they know the scriptures well and they have all this knowledge up in their heads, do not turn and go follow the Lord when his birth is announced. And instead, you get shockingly magicians and astrologers from the east coming to worship him and not his own people. May it not be so among us I think that in our own world, in the United States, in the kind of Western world, Christianity for a long time has kind of seeped into the bones and the fabric of our society. But we're all, we can always be kind of at the danger of just becoming culturally Christian. Okay? That when people ask you, are you a Christian? Do you follow Jesus? You say, oh yeah, you know, like, I, I grew up going to church. I did the catechism thing. I did the, uh, I did the Sunday church thing. I did the, the, uh, the candles on Christmas Eve thing. But when it comes to your actual heart towards the Lord and your obedience and trust in Him, you end up looking nothing like the Magi and a lot more like Herod's court of people who can spout off some things that they think. But when it comes to their own hearts, are far from Him and not really interested in following or trusting the Lord. May it not be so among us as, as, as Christians. When we hear the word of the Lord, may it be upon our heads and our hearts. May it be in our minds and in our feet and in our hands. When he speaks, may we go. When he promises, may we trust. Uh, yeah. So an another lesson, uh, another lesson that I think this passage of Scripture teaches us is this. That the Magi are an excellent example to us um, of spiritual diligence the scripture has a lot to say about kind of persevering in the faith, persevering in trust and following the Lord, okay? Uh, whether it's persevering through hardship or strife or struggle or through doubts that we continue to persevere and trust in God and follow him, uh, it has a lot to say. The scriptures have a ton to say about that. And the wise men become this really kind of telling example at the beginning of the, uh, of the, of the, of the narrative of Matthew of this spiritual diligence that we're talking about. So you'd imagine, I mean, just consider the amount of money and time and, and, and dangers and effort that it took them uh, to find the Lord Jesus, right? We don't know where, the, where in the East they were from, but they do, we do know that they traveled for up to two years to come find Jesus, you know, laying down costly treasures at his throne, laying down uh, their, their pride and their wills before him. That's a lot to lose, and it takes a lot of spiritual diligence in following Christ. We can be sort of finicky sometimes. I mean, we can start these, you know, like Bible reading plans at the beginning of the year, and you get through like your first couple of, uh, uh, of passages, and then things get kind of busy, and by Thursday, January 4th, you're sort of like, Okay, I got, I got other stuff to do. And the search stops, right? Or you can have a question in your mind or a doubt in your heart, and instead of seeking out wisdom uh, and, and seeking understanding from people in the know or people more mature than yourself, you just say, eh, that'll take a lot of work. 
You may have a, a neighbor that you know God is calling you to love and care for. But it's so easy for us to think, yeah, that'll be complicated. I have a pretty busy schedule. I don't really like that person as it is. So maybe I won't do it, right? That's not spiritual diligence, folks. That's spiritual wimpiness. Let us be like the Magi, right? Let us do as they did, to journey with the Lord through the ups and downs of life, through the deserts and the oases, through the challenges and hardships, uh, at great cost or great time, whatever it may be. May we say, as they did, we're willing. Let's go. If it's rough, let's take it on. Let us not be kind of passive, weak-minded, cultural Christians, but instead say, let's follow the Lord with all we have. It's a, great, it's, a, it's a great lesson, I think, that we learn. Spiritual diligence. Also, I think uh, a great example of, of faith for us, too, they have, because they didn't know. They weren't working with a lot of information, right? Think about what they were working with. They were working with a star. They were maybe working with the scriptures, okay? Uh, we know that Daniel and the people of God were exiled in the east, in Babylon, and in Persia. And so very likely, potentially, uh, they left a scriptures or a history of the faith and the prophecies that came to them. So maybe in Babylon or maybe in Persia, where these men were from, they had some scriptures. And maybe they did follow those. But they are not in a, uh, a Jewish environment. All they have is a star. And they say, well, it must mean something. Saddle up the camels. Let's go. The scriptures are full of these sorts of stories, these kind of little breadcrumbs of faith, these little breadcrumbs of promises that you see individuals hanging to and clinging to and looking to and following the Lord with very, very little, a small word, a small action. And they say, yeah, we're going. Yes, we are going to trust Maybe you don't know everything about God. Maybe you don't have a bunch of the scriptures memorized. Maybe you haven't seen, maybe he hasn't like opened up the doors to show you all the mysteries or all the wonders that he can do in your life. But may we be like the Magi. I mean, we know way more than they do. You have the full scriptures. You have the full story. You have not only the star, but the scriptures themselves that you get to follow and trust in. May we show the same sort of faith in God's promises to trust in him when he speaks his promises to our lives and our hearts. It's a, it's, it's a wonder to us that we get to do that uh, and get to follow him in that way. Then I think this, this passage of Scripture also, I mean, we, we talk a lot about the Magi, and the Magi are held up as examples of faith, examples of spiritual diligence, just like I shared with you, examples of kind of foreigners that God calls to himself. But I'm always struck by this, that for all you do to, like, to focus on the Magi, think about how God is leading them. Who put the star in the sky? God did. Uh, who, put, who put the wisdom and the desire in their hearts to follow him? God did, right? Who led them to Herod and, uh, and showed them the scriptures that God would be born in Bethlehem? Well, those are God's words that led them there. Who put the star and led the, let them follow it all the way to the place where Jesus was born so that they could knock on the door and say, this is the spot? God did. And do you notice how he did it at great expense and threat to his own son, Jesus? The wise men, for all their wisdom, really almost wreck the plan of salvation that God had intended, right? They go to a maniac king, Herod, and knock on his door and say, Hey, we heard there's going to be a new king. Can you tell us where he's at? And it says that Herod's disturbed. But God, even at the expense of his son, cares enough about these magi from far away, very distant from him, cares enough about them to lead them to his son Jesus that they may lay down uh, their hearts and their treasures before him. Right? It's God leading the way the entire time. The magi would, would never 
ever have found God had God not orchestrated the plan for them to find him. Okay? And I think that teaches us something about the faith. That for all of our kind of mental capacities or maybe our great acts of faith or great feats of faith or whatever, God is really the one behind the scene orchestrating it all, leading us to his promises and to his son Jesus forever. Right? We can always trust in him to do that because he's willing. He did it with them and he did it with you. So may we be like the Magi. May we trust in the Lord's promises leading us on the way. And may we also lay our hearts, whether it's our, our treasures or our times or the, the things that we have to give to the Lord, our most kind of prized possessions, may we lay them before him and say, you're the king of kings. We're here to follow you. We're here to trust you. We're here to worship you and find great joy in you forever. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, uh, we thank you for, uh, for coming to earth to find us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for leading us to your son, Jesus. And Holy Spirit, we thank you for keeping us in the faith and trust of those great promises that we find in him. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.